All right. Well, peace and blessings, everyone. This is Monica Lewis Patrick, your water warrior uh, with We the People of Detroit, once again, bringing to you uh, what we believe is some news you can use. And so we really wanted to make sure that in this season that we're still in a pandemic, that we are still challenged with COVID, and that we still have not only in the city of Detroit, but all across the nation, millions of Americans that are challenged with the inability to afford their water. We know in Chicago that water rates have tripled in the last eight years. We know in Toledo that water rates have doubled in the last four to five months. And we know that Flint was on pace prior to COVID to see their water rates double. But what we know in Detroit is that Detroit has been the canary in the mine. We have been the poster child for what has gone wrong all across this country in terms of divesting from our water infrastructure system. What we know is that the U.S. government has not invested at the level that it used to. That up until 1977, the U.S. government used to invest about 69% of the dollars that went into our water infrastructure. What we now are seeing is somewhere between 7 and 9% of the federal dollars coming into our water infrastructure system. But when you look at Detroit and you look at it in the middle of a pandemic, you cannot ignore the fact that when people cannot wash their hands and properly access sanitation, that it can do nothing more than exacerbate the ability of the inability to control a pandemic. And so we wanted to take this moment to really connect with some of our uh, amazing scholars and experts from around the country and around the region. We wanted to bring to you the best minds on the issue to make sure that Detroiters were connecting the dots between the inaffordability of water that has been a challenge in this city for two decades or more, and the inability to afford water, and then also the issue of not being able to ac access that water during a pandemic. But before we go there, we wanted to take a moment to uplift the amazing work of many of our young people that have stepped into a gap, and that gap happened in this pandemic. You saw seniors and mostly women, and especially women of color and Black women, delivering water, and they've been delivering it for years. But what we found in the middle of a pandemic is that it became extremely difficult to shift water when your most vulnerable groups were those persons that were over 60. Well, thank God for Frontline Detroit, because it was into that gap that we saw many young people from every background and uh, ethnicity that you could think of coming into this work, deputizing themselves and saying, here am I, send me, I'll go deliver the water. And so at this time, we'd like to have Piper Carter come on as one of those amazing members of Frontline Detroit to just talk a little bit about her experience with delivering water and getting it out during a pandemic. Piper, are you there? Yes, thank you so much. Um, just really honored to everyone on this call. Um, thank you, Mama Monica, and all the work of we the, the people of Detroit, and just everyone everywhere doing work because it um, takes uh, many hands to make like light, light work, right? So uh, uh, I just want to name that um, the we that I'm um, speaking of is a coalition. Uh, we call ourselves Frontline Detroit, but uh, we are not the only ones out here doing doing this. We are a part of this uh, beautiful ecosystem that's been created um, under the under duress, <laughs> if you will. Um, and so, uh, as Mama Monica has stated, um, we have been supporting. Um, the work of We the People by organizing people who have um, named themselves to step up um, to volunteer to deliver water door to door. We initially came together to have a People's Movement Assembly back in March of this year. However, we reassembled ourselves as a street team uh, when we, when, as, as COVID uh, uh, revealed itself. And so with that um, rapid response team that we've created, we have, through these uh, past months, been able to uh, meet, um, discuss how we can do things better, organize ourselves, um, do lots of political education, 
Um, and these are kind of like some of the behind the scenes things. And, and we've organized ourselves into teams. And so we have a street team that goes into community and actually does the door to door delivery. So uh, We the People has been doing this for a long time now, many years. And so they have a very well oiled machine um, and that we were able to literally just step into, which is beautiful. And so with that, we, um, in addition to, you know, when, when you see a crisis, your heart immediately tells you that you need to act. And so um, that's what folks did, or like firefighters, you know, just rush in. Yet, when we look at the gravity of what we're dealing with, we also ha recognize that we must take time to step back and reflect and learn. And so with that, we do lots of political education. And so in um, listening to Mama Monica and learning, we realized that um, much of the fight is really helping bring more people into um, this work. And so with that, we have um, created a petition that we had um, during COVID to the um, mayor um, uh, pressuring the head of the water department to turn all water on during the pandemic, which is actually just following the governor's um, executive order to turn all water on. We also, uh, at, we also within that, had different demands. And so as we've been watching COVID, um, we've also been learning that the city itself um, at, through the water department had not been turning on the water and had actually been turning water off. And so we felt it was necessary to keep uplifting that um, info because they were putting out counter information and folks were thinking that everything had been um, taken care of because of the executive order. So we made sure to keep that information visible um, on the internet and in the streets. We made signs. We um, let folks know when we did water distribution because also we want to make sure that we're not saviors, right? That we bring as many people in, especially and including the most impacted, right? Um, as, right. as warriors and as leadership. So with that, lots of people want to get in this work now. We've had some different rallies. We've had some different gatherings. Um, and I've been speaking a little bit, so I'm going to shut it down here. But before I go, I wanted to uh, name just two or three things. One is that the water is still not on. And That's so right. Um, That's right. there is a... Uh, rumor <laughs> that was put out by the mayor himself on uh, his official uh, address to the city that they had uh, eradicated the issue and uh, it has not been eradicated. So we need folks to know that w there's at least 10,000 people or so that currently live in the city of Detroit who are without water during a pandemic. Okay, many of them are frontline uh, and uh, uh, essential workers and um, single mothers, disabled elders. So I want folks to know that. The second thing is that um, I think Mama Monica always uh, kind of says this. I might get it wrong, but it's not your fault, but it's your fight. So we just need That's more. Right. And I'm wrapping up and we just need more people to jump in. We just need more people to jump in because um, there's lots of aspects to this work. Uh, you know, we need your brains, we need your brawn, but we just need you to show up because we need your body to show that you stand for justice and that you care that people have water. And then the very last thing is um, you can do this through either getting with We the People of Detroit, because they got a whole bunch of work for you. Or you could also do uh, through getting with Frontline Detroit. And we're frontlinedetroit.org, or we are Frontline Detroit on all social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, we're landwaterppl at Gmail. My name is Piper Carter, and um, we're going to have a, a candidate um, forum this Thursday, actually, 
on the east side. So you can check our social media for that. It'll be 6 to 7.30 and it'll be online. But um, thank you for the opportunity and um, turn the water on, keep the water on, and clean water saves lives. I say. Thank you so much, Piper Carter. And for those two, uh, make sure you follow Frontline Detroit, but also check out Piper Carter. Piper is an artist. She's an amazing photographer. A lot of the amazing artistry and Afrocentric centeredness in terms of fashion in the city. Piper is on the, the cusp of that. And she also is doing work around recycling and connecting the green movement with, with also the fashion industry. So wanted to lift that as well. Thank you, Piper. We love you and we really appreciate all that you do for the work. Well, next we're gonna have uh, uh, some of our researchers and scholars we really wanted to take this opportunity uh, to make sure that we were answering questions and presenting uh, all of the amazing data and visualization that has been crafted and designed by Professor Emily Kudel. Uh, she is a researcher and an assistant professor of architecture at Lawrence Technical University. Emily coordinates Black Bottom Street v uh, View. If you have not seen it, please research and take the time to look at the work that was done on Black Bottom Street View. She is a founding member of We the People of Detroit Community Research Collective. And previously, Emily was the 2019-2020 Reiner Bannum Fellow at the University of Buffalo. She holds a BS in architecture from the University of Cincinnati and a master's of architecture with high distinction and a certificate in museum studies from the University of Michigan. And so the next voice you'll hear is the exceptional work of professional, Professor Emily Kudel. Hey everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining this teaching. Um, and I just wanna wanna echo the thanks to Frontline Detroit for the incredible work you've been doing and for the leadership you've been providing. Um, so, um, could you go to the next slide? Um, so today we're gonna talk about the ways that our water affordability crisis is a public health crisis. Um, this crisis has major consequences for the safety and stability of our communities, not only in Detroit, but across the United States. Next slide. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, states across the country have stopped shutting off water, thus acknowledging that access to running water is a fundamental public health necessity. We're in a critical moment right now to move policy at the local, state, and national levels towards water affordability. Next slide. In the past 10 years, about 170 families, or 170,000 families have had their water shut off in Detroit. Based on our analysis of the water department's shutoff data, between 2010 and 2017, we estimate that somewhere between 10 to 40 percent of the city's population, so between 63,000 and 270,000 people, have experienced a water shutoff in the city. This practice puts the health of the entire city at risk. According to reporting by Bridge Magazine, 9,500 households that were shut off in 2019 were still shut off January 1st, 2020. Um, so we know that almost 10,000 homes did not have access to water at the time when COVID hit the city. Um, next slide. I'm gonna start by sharing some of the broader context about our water system. And then I'll talk about our latest research on the relationship between COVID-19 and water shutoffs in Detroit. Um, yeah, that one. Um, thanks, Yana. Um, Detroit has a, a vast regional water system, um, one of the largest water and wastewater systems in the world. It contains countless lead soldered pipes and lead service lines. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the scale of our system, um, it takes about an hour to drive from the city of Detroit to the city of Flint. Um, and you can see that, that the regional water system stretches all the way up to Flint. Um, next slide. 
Another thing that's unusual about our water system is that the city of Detroit built, maintained, and operated this vast regional system for 100 years. As the water system expanded to facilitate and subsidize the growth of Detroit's suburbs. For our system's entire existence, it has been the center of a power struggle between the suburbs and the city over control of the water system, which has been fueled by segregation and racism. Next slide. Emergency managers catalyzed both the Detroit and Flint water crises. Mass water shutoffs began under an emergency manager in Flint, or in, in Detroit, and Flint was removed from Detroit's water system and poisoned under an emergency manager in Flint. So here you can see a timeline of water shutoffs from 2010 to 2015 in Detroit. Um, you can see the period of time that Flint was under emergency management, the period of time when Detroit was under emergency management. You can see that water shutoffs spiked immediately after Kevin Orr declared bankruptcy on behalf of the city of Detroit, or when our, our emergency manager, Kevin Orr. Um, and you can also see that the city of Flint was removed from DWSD's system and poisoned um, while both cities were under emergency management. Um, you can also see that during that same period of time in September 2014, the Great Lakes Water Authority is formed. Next slide. This next map gives you a little bit of context about the, uh, the, larger, the, the larger sort of situation around the formation of the Great Lakes Water Authority. Emer uh, so, so Flint, the city of Flint was Detroit's largest wholesale customer. It was the largest customer of the water system, the city of Detroit. Um, removing Flint from the water system, from Detroit's water system, weakened Detroit's finances and helped justify the transfer of control um, of, of the regional system, which was built and operated by the city of Detroit, to a regional authority called the Great Lakes Water Authority, which has majority suburban leadership. So on the right side of the slide, you can see the breakdown of the representatives on the board of water commissioners um, from the Detroit Water and Sewage Department, um, and then how that transitioned to be majority suburban led under the Great Lakes Water Authority. We also know from our research that um, emergency management has been used to uh, override local elected officials um, in majority black cities across Michigan. Um, so we actually mapped where the emergency management laws or consent agreements had been applied um, and how that played out according to racial demographics across the state. And we saw that in almost every case with a couple of small exceptions, emergency management has deployed, been deployed in majority black cities. An emergency manager has the power to override all local elected officials, and this practice has been used to usurp and restructure locally elected governments across the state. Next slide. In 2016, we the people of Detroit Community Research Collective worked with researchers from Henry Ford Health Systems to do a pilot study on the relationship between water shutoffs and water related illnesses. And we were primarily looking at skin and soft tissue diseases and gastrointestinal illnesses. Next slide. Our research showed that people who were diagnosed with water related illnesses were about 1.5 times more likely to live on blocks with water shutoffs. We also found that the inverse is also true. So people who live on blocks that have water shutoffs were 1.55 times more likely to get a water related disease. Next slide. So now I'll get into the, the COVID-19 research that we've been doing. Um, First, we'll go back to the slide I showed earlier, which shows the parts of Detroit that were the most impacted by water shutoffs in 2019. Um, so you see two maps on this slide. The big map shows where uh, the highest number of water shutoffs were concentrated. And so you can see both on the west side and the east side, um, those zip codes in the city were, 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 were by, by a large number, um, more heavily impacted than other parts of the city. Um, the little map, the inside map on the on the bottom left shows the, the rate of shutoffs per population. Um, so this shows um, 
you know, how, how many how many shutoffs per 100,000 people um, each zip code experienced. Um, and, and one of the things I want to point out about this map is um, you can see that 48217, which is um, zip code just in, in uh, sort of far southwest Detroit, um, that also has a really high rate of shutoffs. That's because there is not a very high population in 48217, but the people who live in that zip code experience shutoffs at a higher rate than in other, other parts of the city. Um, next slide. When we look at who lives in the parts of the city that are most impacted by water shutoffs, you can see that the top 10 zip codes for water shutoffs also have some of the highest numbers of households with children, which is the small map inset at the bottom left, um, and the highest concentration of people over 65, um, especially on the west side of the city. Um, so, so the large map is showing people over age 65, and you can see that uh, the, the, the sort of largest concentration in the city is in the west side, especially um, 48219, 48235, and 48221. Um, so there's a really strong overlap between our elderly populations, our populations of children, and the places in the city that are most impacted by shutoffs. Next slide. Um, I, and, and as we transition, I also want to point out that um, in Detroit, people over age 60 uh, represent 42% of all COVID-19 cases in the city and 82% of all COVID-19 related deaths. So we're really, really concerned about that overlap between people who are over 65 and people who are most impacted by shutoffs. Um, so the next thing that we did is we looked at how COVID played out in the city. Um, and so I'm going to show these two maps next to each other and then we're going to zoom in um, to one of the maps in more detail. Um, so on the left, you can see a map of the rate of COVID-19 cases by zip code. Um, and, and so the darkest green areas meant that per capita, those, those areas had the most COVID cases. Um, so you can see there's really kind of two centers of the COVID outbreak by rate in Detroit. Um, the first being on the near east side, um, near, uh, near, near the uh, East Grand Boulevard, um, and the second being on the on the west side near 8 Mile um, in 48235, sort of centered around that zip code. Um, and you can also see, um, we, we've also mapped the locations of nursing homes. Um, there, were, there were huge outbreaks in nursing homes in the city, and, and really all across the country, um, outbreaks were concentrated in nursing homes. Um, and so we, we decided to map where those nursing homes are. And when you look at the rate, you can see there's like a really strong overlap between where nursing homes are and where there's high rates of COVID. So at first glance, you could explain these high rates by saying, well, of course, of course, there's high rates in these places because these are where all the nursing homes are. Um, so the next map um, then becomes really important to start to sort of decode this a bit. Um, we were interested in looking at how water shutoffs might be impacting COVID cases in the city. And so what we were looking at was really what was spreading outside of nursing homes. We, you know, we, we know that, that most nursing homes aren't uh, impacted by water shutoffs, um, and that actually what we were curious about was how COVID was spreading out in the neighborhood, out in the community. Um, and so what we decided to do was look at the, the number, total number of COVID cases um, in the city um, and then look at the percent of those cases that could be attributed to nursing homes versus the percent that were attributed to um, other forms of spread out in the, out in the neighborhood. Um, and so this tells a really different story. Um, on the west side of the city, you can see, um, especially in 48235, which is the, um, the darkest green zip code on the west side, um, there were, um, as, of, uh, as of June 13th, um, 2020, those numbers have, have changed by now, but as of June 13th, there were 1,042 cases in this zip code. Um, and you can see actually a pretty small percentage of those cases happen within nursing homes. Versus if you look on the east side, you can see um, you know, in, in the zip code where, where East Grand Boulevard uh, meets the river, you can see there were uh, 495 total cases of COVID and almost half happened within nursing homes. So there's a really different story playing out on the west side of the city and on the near east side of the city, where many, many more cases on the west side are happening outside of nursing homes out in the community. And also there's a much higher number of cases happening on the west side. Um, so next slide. 
So this is the map that we feel really starts to tell the story about the relationship between water shutoffs and COVID in the city, um, where we see a high correlation between the zip codes that are most impacted by shutoffs. Um, if you look at it by rate and if you look at it by number, um, you can see that there's a strong overlap between the parts of the city that have COVID spread specifically outside of nursing homes, out in the neighborhood, um, and, and the, those, those same zip codes that are impacted the most by water shutoffs. And, and we'll have time, I think, for questions at the end. Um, so if, if folks have questions about these, I know this is a lot of info to digest in a short amount of time. Um, we can make the slides available afterwards and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, but that's the end of my slides. So um, now we're, we're gonna go next to Nadia Gaber. Thank you so much, Emily. And as you stated, we're definitely gonna take questions at the end and definitely you can put some of your questions in the chat as they're coming up. Uh, but the next voice you'll hear after mine is Dr. Nadia Gaber. Uh, Dr. Gaber received her PhD from a joint program in medical anthropology from UCSF and UC Berkeley and is obtaining her MD at UCSF with support from the National Institutes of Health and Medical Science Training Program. Her research on the politics of urban health and safety in the U.S. considers how the social and material legacies of industrial capitalism flow between body and environment. Her current project, Life After Water, Detroit, Flint, and the Post-Industrial Politics of Health, examines water as a social force through which debates over governance of the urban commons takes place. She is a proud member of We the People of Detroit's Community Research Collective. I present to you, Dr. Nadia Gaber. Well, thank you. Yes, I am. So um, I am proud to be talking about some of the research um, that we're doing right now and following up um, Emily's great presentation on how it connects to this moment in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so I want to go back and just talk generally about um, some of the work that we've done to try to demonstrate that water shutoffs are a public health crisis. Um, we've been trying to do this work for about five years now, um, making the case against um, you know, a legal environment and a city that politically is opposing this argument, which in the public health literature um, and common sense is just that, it's common sense. We know that shutting off water um, causes disruptions to health. Um, but how do you kind of turn that into statistics that you can kind of use in those arenas? Um, so I'm going to talk about two original community-led studies that um, we, the people of Detroit, did on that relationship. And then I'm going to talk generally about how we think about water and health um, in a kind of broad, politically informed public health framework, and then talk um, back again about COVID and some of the racial disparities that we see. So. This photo is from um, one of our studies that we did in 20, um, sorry, 2016, looking at um, a citywide picture of water shutoffs um, and their consequences. So we used CDC toolkits, um, which have this kind of method built in to be reliable and rapid and was actually designed to be used in the event of disaster so that you could get a, um, a statistically representative picture of the city. And we um, organized volunteers um, and community members and we the people of Detroit members um, to do a lot of the surveying, statistical sampling and all of the door-to-door um, -door work. And um, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, thanks. So um, this kind of shows you like um, through random sampling the neighborhoods that we um, looked at the census blocks. And as you can see, we looked at neighborhoods with a high, medium, and low prevalence of shutoffs. So the um, color um, density in the back shows uh, the rate of water shutoffs. And um, we did find a baseline picture of high incidence of shutoffs and shutoff notices. So 26% of people across the city of Detroit had gotten shutoff notices, and 5% of the homes that we surveyed were without water at the time of contact. Um, thank God we had such a strong community organization and the founders were um, forethinking enough to create the water rights hotline so that we could immediately refer people to an emergency basis of getting water. Um, we found that people had a long length of shutoff. So 10 and a half days was the average time people went without water living in their homes. 
And that um, contradicted the city's claim of um, people not going more than 24 or 48 hours without their water off. And another surprising finding was that 51% um, of residents in Detroit were using bottled water as a primary drinking water source. And that includes 30% of people who told us they only drink bottled water. Um, people had um, expressed issues around trust um, and the quality of their tap water. This is as the Flint water crisis story was um, getting uh, more and more national headlines. And um, residents were spending a striking average of $56 a month on bottled water. So when we talk about the unaffordability of water, we also have to consider what people are going out and spending on bottled water because they may not trust that their water is safe or that they're going to have continued access to it. Next slide. So um, in 2016, the County Authority Health Agency released a statement saying that we should have a moratorium on shutoffs to protect vulnerable groups, which includes infants and children, um, seniors uh, 62 and above, people with mental illness and disabilities, um, breastfeeding or expectant mothers, and people dealing with chronic diseases. Basically a health-based moratorium on water shutoffs. And based on our survey, 82% of the residents in Detroit um, would be ineligible for shutoffs based on that health exemption criteria alone. So clearly you're talking about an already health vulnerable population and you're adding a very significant exposure in the form of water shutoffs. Next slide. So then we did another study and we were looking to establish um, whether all the emotional symptoms that people told us about as we were surveying, including agitation, trouble sleeping, nightmares, depression, anxiety, were actually an effect of water shutoffs themselves. And so we did a targeted um, survey where we could do some statistical analysis. And this is the part where, you know, we kind of report to what basically we already know, which is that, yes, there's a statistically significant relationship between water shutoffs and um, psychological distress. Um, and so we found that 25% um, of those um, had agitated behavior, 30% um, had anxiety and stress, a third had trouble sleeping or nightmares, and a quarter had depressed mood. So um, these are taking a significant toll on mental health. Sorry, this, next slide. And um, particularly on those who are most vulnerable. So that study was done at the Brightmore Food Connection Pantry. Um, and you can see the sign um, that's covered by all these cases of water that were delivered. It says water for people, no to shutoffs. Um, you can go to the next slide. And this is just um, a table from the paper that's coming out from that study. Um, that kind of goes into just quantifying the level of that psychological distress. And the only thing that I'll point out in addition to um, reiterating that there is a significant relationship to mental health um, is that that, really, that um, impact on mental health was there for people who had unaffordable water, even if their water was still running. So it takes a toll, the fear that your water could be shut off or will be shut off or that you've gotten a notice or just that you can't afford these rising rates has um, such an impact on mental health that it shows up in these statistical um, models and samples. Next slide. Another part of that study was we asked people about how they've shifted their health-related behaviors um, in the face of this water stress. So when we asked people if they drank water they thought might be unsafe for their health since the city began these mass water shutoffs, again, this is a, a food insecure community, more than 80% of people said, yes, they drank water they thought might be unsafe for their health. A third said they collected water from an undesirable or dirty source. People worried they wouldn't have enough water. Um, but they're also borrowing and sharing water with neighbors, friends, or relatives. Now, again, this was before coronavirus, and you can imagine what the social distancing, physical distancing, and isolation of this time means for those who um, relied on these informal networks of borrowing and sharing water to not be able to do that. Next slide. So I want to um, now talk generally about the relationship between water and health and go back to this um, paper that was written, a white paper by the former deputy director of the Detroit Department of Health um, that showed this spike in three relatively rare waterborne infectious diseases, Campylobacter, Shigella, and Giardia, around the initiation of these mass water shutoffs, and they were all centered in Detroit. Um, and this, uh, in this study, um, 
the author argued that this was most likely due to water shutoffs, which have a very plausible mechanism for causing all of these um, rarely seen infectious diseases. Next slide. And so this slide being a little busy, apologies, is an attempt to kind of think about the big picture of water and health and its relationships. Um, so we'll just start um, with the direct impact. So how, uh, what are the direct ways in which um, water insecurity um, impacts health? So the routes of exposure to, for example, these waterborne infectious diseases would be through ingestion, through your gut, inhalation, um, and touch, um, dermal absorption. And um, through, through that, we can be exposed through um, the water that we drink through the foods that we eat, whether directly through uh, especially fish, but also fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, we can be exposed um, to waterborne diseases through um, recreational activities like fishing and swimming. Um, and we can also be exposed by just use of water in our household, showering, for example. And um, the next kind of column down, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, um, on the left there kind of shows what are the hazards to which we're exposed. So this left cluster is supposed to kind of represent the bugs and the pathogens to which we're exposed. So bacteria, protozoa, and viruses um, that cause waterborne diseases. Um, then we have this chemical symbol for the chemical hazards like PFAS, which we know is a big problem in Michigan, these kind of toxic industrial pollutants. Um, we have the faucet to represent lead and other metals that run through our aging piping system and can leach into the drinking water. And then we have these pharmaceutical um, and personal care products and their metabolites are often found um, in increasing concentrations in our drinking water systems. And what's driving a lot of these exposures? Well, we have a lot of industrial pollution, it's unregulated. We have poor history of zoning and residential segregation. That means that those pollutants concentrate um, in the groundwater and the surface water, particularly in communities of color, but in these urban areas, urban industrial areas. Then we have a kind of climate related impacts on the weather. So increasing heat, heavy rainfalls, floods, creating a kind of urban runoff. Um, we know that Detroit has a combined sewer, combined sewer overflow system that um, leads to a lot of urban flooding every year um, that brings dangerous um, untreated sewage into people's homes and into our waterways. And then we have algal blooms and invasive species um, that are beginning to pose serious ecological damage to the Great Lakes. So that's kind of what people conventionally think of when they talk about waterborne diseases. Um, and in the US, you know, um, more than 200 million people do have direct access to disinfected public water, but there's as many as 9 million cases of waterborne diseases every year. Um, Many of these cases, um, especially the gastrointestinal illnesses, don't even go reported. So I think a lot of this is complicated by our inability to have good surveillance and good data. Um, in part because many of those illnesses, like a, a GI bug, would be self-limiting in healthy people, but they can be very um, chronic, devastating, and even fatal in infants and in elderly people and people with pre-existing health conditions like compromised immune systems, people on chemotherapy, people who've had transplants who have diabetes or um, other chronic um, illnesses. And judging from that CASPER study, we know that this is um, a very health vulnerable population. Then I think less talked about are the indirect in ways in which water impacts health. So I tried to kind of express these routes of exposure being, um, you know, through law, media, social networks, um, economic relationships, and the geography of a city, um, the whole domain of uh, what we call political economy and the social sciences, um, leading to things like um, in means of exposure, you have this hand washing icon because one of the main issues that we have been pushing is that water shutoffs would impede people's ability to wash their hands regularly, frequently with hot running water. And that is the CDC's number one recommendation for stopping the spread of coronavirus. We know um, that people are cost shifting from essential expenses like their groceries, um, their rent, their education costs, their transportation in order to pay water bills. Um, when Detroiters pay an average of 10% of their household income on water, um, that is well above both the human rights standard and the national standard for affordability. And then there's also um, a kind of so exposure to social stigma um, to racism, to a fear, for example, that CPS can remove children from homes without running water. And there's ways in which it furthers isolation. 
And then the hazard to which people are exposed, again, this kind of spider web is really meant to represent a virus. Um, and in this case, coronavirus. So again, not being able to wash your hands. Um, coronavirus and even um, viruses like hepatitis A, for which we know there was an outbreak that was never investigated um, in relation to um, water shutoffs. Um, we also, there's a recent study in the American Journal of Public Health talking about how, um, remember I talked about how so many people are turning to bottled water um, but a lot of people are not drinking water at all, and we've seen a radical decrease in um, the amount of people, Americans, who just drink plain water, particularly in kids, um, which is leading to more and more um, ingestion of these sodas and sugar-sweetened beverages um, that have, you know, obviously an impact on childhood obesity, but are also really concerning for oral health and just overall development, the impacts on mental health, the impacts um, the kidneys kind of representing an impact on dehydration, which is particularly um, serious in the elderly. And then of course, housing insecurity, which I know Aaron is gonna talk about. Um, and we've also talked about the ways in which um, water foreclose, water shutoffs have been used to foreclose on people's homes. Um, and even if the house itself isn't foreclosed, it makes a house unlivable. So it kind of reproduces a lot of housing insecurity. And then lastly, um, the kind of drivers of those exposures. Well, one of them, as I mentioned, is this um, lack of scientific research, first an inability to kind of quantify a lot of these impacts, but also a kind of deliberate negligence on the part of city and state officials to investigate the health consequences of water shutoffs. Um, another is the kind of medically vulnerable population um, of a community routinely exposed for decades um, to unequal burdens of environmental harms and um, unequal access to care you have the financialization of the water department and of these bills, um, which has increased tenfold in the past, I'm sorry, 200% in the past 10 years. Um, and then you have, as we all know, um, the depopulation of the city and the, the, the moving of jobs offshores. And lastly, the criminalization of poverty um, and the ways in which um, policing and incarceration are meant to um, kind of enforce uh, discipline and order rather than actually giving people access to the resources that they need to stay healthy. Okay, next slide. So, sorry, Tiana, can you um, just let me know how much time I have left? I'll try to go quickly through this part. I apologize for the last slide being a lot at once. Um, but just to talk about um, COVID and um, race and the disproportionate effects, I think many of us have been following the media on this um, and know that both the death rate and the case rate has been disproportionately higher in the African-American community across most of the United States. Um, this, by the way, is also true for the Hispanic and Latinx community and for Native Americans, um, very importantly. And I'll come back to that. Next slide. Um, and that's in the context of having to, first of all, make a political push for um, getting data reported by race and ethnicity in the first place. A lot of the early reports about coronavirus didn't take into account the discriminatory impacts at all because that data wasn't being reported. Um, and we're still missing a lot of data um, because it's up to states whether they report this data. And in addition, of course, we know there's a lack of testing infrastructure and that lack is hardest in communities um, of color. So um, we can just expect that all of these statistics are actually undercounting of the real problem. Next. So the main way I think that that um, disparity has been explained and represented is that there is um, a larger share of pre-existing health conditions um, in communities of color. So more asthma, more diabetes, more heart disease, and these are the things that drive COVID mortality. Um, that is true. Um, but that in itself is a result of these systemic disparities and something that needs to always be contextualized in that um, historical framework. And in addition, it only explains the difference in mortality rate. It doesn't explain why communities of color have higher case rates. And so for that, you can't look to underlying health conditions. You have to think about some of those sociopolitical causes, some of those indirect ways. Next slide. And I think when I saw this graph um, showing that those race gaps in the COVID death rates actually decrease in the elderly population, it kind of puts that into um, relief because it's really the inverse, I think, of our expectations um, that we can explain away the racial disparities in COVID death rates by 
chronic health conditions, which of course are more concentrated in people over 65. And here we're saying that actually there's, the disparity is highest um, in the younger and younger age groups. So I think a lot more work and research needs to be done here. Next slide. Um, we know that communities of color um, face increased challenges accessing COVID-related, again, testing and treatment services, partly as a lack of um, insurance, less likely to be insured compared to white Americans. Um, and partly, again, because even if they have insurance, sometimes co-pays and costs of getting to a doctor or the cost of um, your portion of the treatment um, deters people from going and seeing a doctor at all. Um, and that's in this bottom right um, graph. Next slide. And then, um, as we've been talking about, and to circle back to the question of water, um, a lot of it relates to um, a general um, insecurity facing communities of color to financial um, risks, kind of driving a lot of these health risks. Um, so economic and social circumstances will prevent a lot of people from being able to safely shelter in place. Imagine sheltering in a home that doesn't have access to running water. Um, so you can see the racial disparities in people who are worried, for example, about paying their monthly bills and going back to um, the work from Mapping the Water Crisis that Emily presented, we know that that's a geographically and racially distributed form of insecurity, that the bills are actually higher in the city where people are densely crowded and where um, they have fewer financial resources and are being asked to actually pay a bigger share of the costs. Next slide. So um, this is a recent study um, just from earlier this year um, showing on American Indian reservations, um, some, they studied a number of factors that were contributing to increased coronavirus deaths. And they concluded that in part, there were really two factors that arose to the level of significance. One was a language barrier, so people who didn't have access to health information um, that wasn't being translated into native languages. Um, and the second, the important one for us today, is this failure to account for the lack of complete indoor plumbing and access to potable water. So um, they've shown that where people don't have access to running water, um, there is a significant um, impact on the spread of COVID and on deaths from COVID. Uh, I just want to thank Attorney Jennings for sharing that study. Um, and hopefully, if we have time, um, she can speak to some of this work as well, because it's really been a long effort to try to demonstrate this relationship. Next slide. So this um, just zooms us out globally. This is also a very recent study um, from just, I think, a month ago um, about how water insecurity globally is compounding the coronavirus crisis. And this is the proportion of residents um, in regions across the world who reported an inability to um, wash their hands in the last 30 days. So um, you can just you know, the, the United States may not appear on this as an average, but I think if we separated out um, American Indian reservations, the Navajo Nation, Detroit, Flint, and P these um, cities that we're talking about, um, you might um, find a lot of homology between what's happening on the global scale. Um, and, and I think one other thing that's important to mention um, is that more than half a million people are unhoused or experience homelessness across the United States on a given night. Um, and so they constitutively don't have access to running water, to sanitation, to the ability to wash their hands um, during this pandemic. Next slide, this is my last. Um, I just wanted to um, talk about hand washing in the context of some of the ways it's been talked about nationally um, to let us be aware of um, behavior-based explanations um, for um, this, this legitimate problem. So on the left, you have the Surgeon General of the United States um, who said in a press conference to speaking specifically to communities of color, you know, we need you to avoid alcohol, tobacco, and drugs, call your friends and family, check in on your mother. She wants to hear from you. And speaking of mothers, we need you to do this. If not for yourself, then for your abuela, do it for your granddaddy, do it for your big mama, do it for your pop pop. Um, a lot of people took that as a way of um, conflating this kind of um, avoidance of alcohol, tobacco, and drugs with uh, as the targeted messaging for communities of color um, and not actually recognizing 
anything beyond, as I talked about, those kind of chronic health conditions that may drive disparities in death rates, but don't drive disparities in the number of cases that we're seeing, um, and don't speak at all to the historical and systemic um, disparities that have created those chronic um, conditions uh, in, in communities of color. And then on the right, um, this is State Representative um, Steve Huffman, who's also um, a physician, um, who asked um, at a public hearing, could it just be that African Americans or the colored population do not wash their hands as well as other groups or wear masks or do not socially distance themselves? So again, um, it's kind of turning the responsibility, I think, for the lack of hand washing back onto the communities who are marginalized and disinvested from the resources that they need to be able to protect themselves. Um, so institutional racism of this type kind of traffics on old tropes. Um, last slide. And I think um, just to wrap up, um, our conversation set the stage for q and I think it's a time that, in which we're all asking questions about what it means to live in community and in proximity to one another, um, what it is to share in the urban commons, including its air, its water, and its land, and about what collective safety looks like, um, particularly as we also confront the violence of policing in the name of safety and security um, in cities that have funded um, that form of collective safety and defunded um, for example, the water, which is um, so integral to physical, emotional, environmental health, um, and the life of the city itself. That's all I got. Well, all you've got is amazing. And so thank you so much, Dr. 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 Nadia Gaber for an amazing presentation. And also just wanna uplift again, Professor Emily Kudel uh, the two of them have been instrumental, and I just want to take a moment to lift this. Uh, the We the People of Detroit's Community Research Collective has been driven by the brilliance and the genius of both of these young women. Uh, they have dedicated a significant amount of time over the last five years to help us frame and shape a body of work that is driven for the people, with the people, and centering the people that are most impacted. And so I just want to say hats off to you. I want to salute you. Uh, I don't think we could ever say thank you enough and express the gratitude that we have at We the People of Detroit for the amazing work that you've helped us all see ourselves as a part of. So thank you. And next we're going to go into, uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're still going to be in the theme of water and water rights and knowing our, our water rights. Uh, but as Nadia and uh, Dr. Gaber and as uh, Professor Kudel have presented to you, they've given you a lot of data, a lot of visualization of why we've got to move in a direction that is ushering in the human right to water. But we wanted to make sure that attorney Aaron Matty uh, had a chance to update you in terms of where we are legally on the issues of water rights and water justice. And so Aaron is an attorney and an Equal Justice Works Fellow at the Great Lakes Environmental Law Center here in the great city of Detroit. Aaron's work focuses on protecting children in southeastern Michigan from home-based environmental health hazards like lead paint, lead-contaminated drinking water, and water shutoffs by providing legal counseling and representation to a, attacked families and advocating for policies that advance environmental justice. She received her JD from Wayne State University Law School, her MS from the School for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan, and her BA from Kalamazoo College. Erin is also just a, a great environmentalist and somebody that's passionate about making sure that all of these environmental rights are protected. So I present to you the amazing attorney, Erin Matty. Thank you so much, Monica, um, and thank you. Um, to everyone that's, that's joined us today. Um, as Monica mentioned, um, I'm going to be discussing the, the current legal landscape regarding the COVID-19 pandemic um, a, and water access and affordability and um, some of the efforts to ensure affordability uh, after this pandemic is over, um, whenever that will be, uh, and particularly a proposed amendment to um, the Detroit City Charter. Um, so, as I'm sure many of you are aware, in March, Governor Whitmer issue, issued uh, an executive order mandating a temporary moratorium on 
water shutoffs um, and a requirement that public water systems restore service to all Michigan residents so that uh, residents would be able to wash their hands regularly and avoid leaving uh, the home to access water, um, which as we've heard is our critical actions for preventing uh, the spread of the virus. Uh, the order also imposed some reporting requirements on water systems that have engaged in shutoffs uh, with the state seeking information about the number of occupied homes without water service. Um, and since the executive order was issued, we've been working to ensure that it's fully implemented. Um, we know that not all homes have water yet um, and that shutoffs are still occurring. So we've been uh, working to help residents navigate DWSD's administrative process for service reconnection called the Water Restart Plan, um, as well as tracking statewide uh, reconnection reporting with a particular focus on Detroit and Southeast Michigan communities. Um, under this Water Restart Plan, uh, the, state, uh, the state of Michigan covered customer costs to restore water service um, through uh, April 9th, um, and that covered uh, residents who had had their water service recently interrupted due to non-payment or uh, received notice uh, via like a door hanger um, that they were at risk of service to uh, of service interruption for non-payment. Um, once uh, through this plan, once customers were reconnected, they'd still be responsible for paying $25 a month uh, to keep water service throughout the pandemic. Um, and the, the plan doesn't pay the full bill, um, or if, once enrolled in the plan, um, customers would not have to pay their full bill uh, or any past due amount until the COVID situation passes, but um, households uh, will still be responsible for the bill, full bill uh, once that period is over. Um, the plan also automatically enrolls uh, uh, customers in either WRAP or the 103050 plan. Um, earlier this month, the governor signed another executive order extending these protections through the end of the year. Uh, beyond uh, those efforts, beyond the executive order, uh, in June, the Michigan legislature passed a bill that grants $25 million to water utility providers across the state to um, assist customers with the rearages. Um, but it's the, that assistance is limited to $700 per household and doesn't provide relief um, for back bills that were incurred before the pandemic and it won't uh, cover bills after December 2020. Um, so beyond the short term, the short term assistance uh, in response to the pandemic, um, the, the legal landscape uh, of water access and affordability isn't just isn't very favorable. Um, unfortunately, there's no enforceable legal right to water service, uh, let alone to affordable water service under federal, state, or local law. Um, and in fact, Michigan law explicitly allows uh, local units of government to uh, cut off water service to residents um, who haven't paid their water bills, regardless of poverty or other hardships. Uh, so the primary tools that we have right now for addressing water affordability um, beyond the, the uh, COVID relief uh, is just DWSD policies. Um, and uh, Monica and I both participated in some facilitated conversations with DWSD over the past couple of years prior to the pandemic um, and tried to get them to change some policies um, and to address water affordability and shutoff crises. Uh, and, and while there were some changes to policy, including allowing um, customers to be represented by a third party advocate during interactions with customer service um, and limiting the shutoff uh, threshold to uh, customers who are more than $1,000 behind on their water bill. Um, these, these changes to official policy have been pretty irregularly applied and really not communicated with the public effectively. Um, and especially during the pandemic, getting a response from DWSD on these issues uh, has been really difficult because uh, they've They've just been put on the back burner. Um, so in order to provide a more sustainable long-term solution to water unaffordability, uh, we the people of Detroit and other, and other community partners are recommending a charter amendment to the Detroit City Charter uh, that will really champion water affordability. Um, and the recommendations uh, will achieve that goal by establishing principles to guide decision making for DWSD that are really grounded in racial and economic equity um, and public health. Um, as well as establishing a water affordability framework. So the amendment that we're recommending, um, you can see an overview uh, here on the screen of some of the key points. Um, but this, 
what we're recommending is modeled on the charters, the city charters of other uh, cities such as Baltimore, Oakland, Philadelphia, um, as well as uh, based on Detroit City Chart. Detroit City Council's own blue ribbon panel on water affordability recommendations. Um, so they're not, you know, radical or even really out of the ordinary. Um, there's something that just uh, uh, should already be in place, frankly. Um, the recommendations are also, uh, we've, we've vetted them and they are in compliance with state and local law. Um, we at uh, Great Lakes Environmental Law Center recently released a report that analyzes this very issue and concludes that they're aren't really any legal barriers to implementing income-based water rates under Michigan law, despite the, the story that's been told by uh, state and local leaders for, for a very long time. Um, so the specific recommendations we're making include uh, first establishing a health and all policies provision, which would require the city and all of its departments, not just DWSD, to consider health equity in its decision-making, um, including uh, policy development and implementation, budgeting, and the delivery of services. Um, and so we're proposing that the city measure whether it's meeting the health needs of residents by the availability of affordable, accessible, and nutritious food, safe, affordable drinking water and sewer service, of course, and affordable, safe, and healthy housing. Um, another key recommendation would be the creation of a community advisory board to advise the city and the Board of Water Commissioners in the development of um, equitable and affordable water and sewer rates and policies. Uh, we'd also establish a fund for short-term water and sewer bill payment assistance uh, for households experiencing hardships. Uh, and this, would, this is meant to work in tangent with the, the RAP program that's already in place to address short-term emergency financial needs, uh, whereas the affordable rate structure would address the long-term systemic on affordability. Um, and it would also be different from RAP in that it would be controlled by the city rather than uh, GLIWA and administered through, uh, which is uh, in charge of RAP and uh, RAP is also administered through uh, Wayne Metro. Um, we would also create an emergency plan for the provision of public potable water during disasters and emergencies, including mass water shutoffs, um, as well as water main breaks or contamination. Uh, and, and really most importantly, it would establish that all Detroiters have a legal right to safe and affordable water and sewer services regardless of income. So specifically, this would include a rate affordability program, as I previously mentioned, that um, is based on the water affordability program that Roger Colton designed for the city back in 2005 um, that was unfortunately never implemented, um, as well as more robust, <coughs> excuse me, more robust consumer protections regarding late fees, service disconnections, uh, and payment plans. Uh, transparency, transparency and equity in rate determinations, collections, uh, and service termination policies and practices, um, and providing accessible payment centers that address the digital and generational divide in uh, technological knowledge and access, especially among low-income and elderly residents. Uh, we know that not everyone has internet access or transportation to get to um, the, the payment kiosks that are provided at DWSD customer care centers um, or to pay online. Um, our recommendations would also disallow the enforcement of property tax liens resulting from outstanding water and sewer bills. So currently, if a customer fa fails to pay their water bill balance, DWSD can place um, any amount of the unpaid water and sewer bill on the city of Detroit property tax roll as a lien for collection purposes. Uh, which means basically that the city can seize someone's property over a water bill. Um, and the data I have is, is a little old, but in 2014, about 12,000 tax foreclosed homes that the city put up for auction had water debt included with the property taxes. So we know that um, you know, this is leading to housing instability as well as, as health issues. Um, Finally, the, uh, uh, the charter recommendation would adopt the United Nations human right to water and sanitation principles to ensure that all residents um, have the ability to access and pay for safe, clean water and, uh, and sewer services. So these, these recommendations are currently being finalized uh, and we'll be formally submitting a proposed charter revision by the end of this week um, with all uh, proposed amendments for the Detroit City Charter being due on July 31st. Um, so that, that concludes uh, my, my information about the Detroit City Charter and the legal landscape um, related to water affordability in the city. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erin. We really appreciate you and all the work that you guys do over at the Great Lakes Environmental Law Center. 
uh, it's just been exceptional how you've been able to guide this work around helping the community identify how to strengthen the charter. And the reason that we wanted to make sure that this was moved upon is because there are charter revisions that are due. Uh, can you give us that date, Aaron? July 31st. So the end of By this July 31st. So we need folks, if you have any recommendations that will uplift and ensure water security for Detroiters, uh, that deadline is coming up, but this was critical information because we didn't want to leave our water security to someone else's control. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to make sure that we were calling upon our experts to provide you with the best information to give you the best opportunity to take back power and maintain power over your city and over your asset and access to the commons because as we're seeing, water is still being denied to the very people that have invested in and built the city that over 40% of the state of Michigan is drinking from. So I'm gonna stop there because we really wanna leave time for questions. But before we go to Q&A, Tiana, could I just have a couple of moments of privilege uh, because I see that we have on the, the line uh, two of Detroit's finest. We have uh, the Honorable uh, Reverend Dr. Joanne Watson on the line, who is the architect, one of the legislative champions of water affordability. And then we also have on the line uh, attorney Alice Jennings, who is leading uh, the way not only here in the region, but across the nation around advancing a legal strategy for water affordability. So Tiana, could you allow uh, a couple of moments for both of those persons to speak to our audience, uh, you just you can't have that kind of greatness on the line and not acknowledge it. Absolutely, we're actually running early, so no problem at all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. I want, to, I want to say congratulations for another great, great session. We, the people of Detroit, I'm so proud of all the presenters. So proud of uh, those who have given uh, so much of themselves and sacrifice so that our people can have access to affordable, quality, clean water. We have a right to water. It's a human right. I'm just happy to be here. And it's been a blessing to hear the great presentations. And I want the world to know that there was uh, an absolute water affordability plan approved by the Detroit City Council during my tenure. And it uh, and was implemented by one of the founders of We the People of Detroit, Cecily McClellan, our Sister Ebony, with the support of many, many who are on this line. And it's, it's a shame before God that that process of making sure all the people had access to water was uh, uh, ended uh, without uh, warning and without rationale. But it's a, ple it's a pleasure to be here and I thank you for the opportunity to just bring greetings. Thank you, God bless. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Councilwoman Joanne Watson. And I just think it's always critical that we understand that Detroit has never been void of a solution to this particular problem. But what we have been done, uh, what has happened is that we have met many challenges and blockages from moving forward something that really has already been ordained of God. And we know that water is a human right. Uh, we continue to fight for that right. And we know that Detroit has been an excellent example of what happens when the people decide that they're gonna go in a particular direction. And so the direction we're going in is ushering in that human right. But I'd like to make sure that attorney Alice Jennings, uh, who is a great champion of this issue, has led the legislative fight around this issue uh, to make sure that she has a few moments to be able to speak to you as well. Well, <clears throat> thank you. I, I did not intend to speak today. I was gonna not say anything and listen, but let me just tell you that uh, we the people, uh, they have really, you have created a wonderful resource here in the community and statewide on the issue of water and other issues and facets of um, this city and what's going on. And we so appreciate it. Uh, I wanna thank Monica particularly. We had a real problem uh, <clears throat> gathering forth people who had had uh, their water cut off and who were willing to stand for justice. And uh, with um, Monica's help and Cicely's help, we were able to get 
some excellent plaintiffs to stand and they're really quite um, concerned, not just for their own water uh, not having it, but also for, for others in this community. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Gaber for her work. We worked <laughs> back and forth on a declaration that became part of the complaint and the, the I'm calling it water case part two, uh, dealing with the uh, civil rights case that was recently filed. I want to thank Joanne Watson, Reverend Watson, for all of the leadership and love she has shown all of us over these many, many, many years and the fight to show us that the fight and the stamina needed, the fight power must continue because we're close. You know, you can almost see it. You can almost feel that we have reached a moment in time that it is time for the righteousness of water uh, flowing for all to come about. And yet it is that last piece of mile that sometimes it gets a little bit uh, rough and you know with COVID and us losing so many of our friends and family uh, through uh, that uh, virus it has created for us a absolute certainty that we must do this. So let me just say that uh, the lawsuit is just been filed. We're fighting for all of the things that uh, need to be done here, particularly affordable water for all in Detroit, uh, as well as we're hoping that if we can get the governor's attention and the mayor's attention in such a way with this second piece of litigation that it will be a template that can be used throughout the state. Uh, I just want to say to uh, Aaron on the charter piece, I don't know if there's a piece in there about decriminalization or not, but we do need to make sure that there's a decriminalization process here because what we're finding as we work through this latest piece of litigation is that there are hundreds of citizens in the city with water running at some level, but it's illegal. So, you know, they don't want to say, hey, by what is illegal, would you turn it on legally now? Because there's, of course, the potential for, for uh, arrest and prosecution. And right now it's a five-year felony. So I just want to add that we're going to need all the support we can for this litigation. Uh, and we will, it's, it's uh, in front of uh, Judge Davis, in uh, U.S. District Court, um, and we're just getting it going. But any information we need, we will have a process called discovery where we can ask for it. So if there are uh, issues that come up where information is needed, we can utilize the litigation as a process to gather information as well. Thank you all. Love you. I love you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alex. We love you as well. And we just appreciate all the exceptional leadership and work that you have provided. And of course, we can't say enough about our Queen Mother. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of greatness, as you can see. Uh, and so we definitely wanted to make sure that we gave uh, space for that leadership and that voice. We always want to honor that at We the People of Detroit. Uh, but I also want to make sure that, th as we always center our mission, is to inform is to train and mobilize. So you've been informed uh, to some degree. I hope you've been trained and now it's to mobilize. And so we wanna make sure that we're responding to your Q and A. Uh, and then we begin to take our action steps on what we're gonna do next now that we've gotten all of this amazing information. So Tiana, I'm gonna turn it over to you now for Q and A. Okay, yes. And um, I just want to say, as Nadia has pointed out in the chat, that we also have some of the other We the People of Detroit founders on the line, too. We want to acknowledge you and thank you all for the work that you've done. Um, so we have Cecily McClellan, Aurora Harris, um, Deborah Taylor, and Chris Griffith. Thank you so much for um, just 
bringing this organization to us so that we can address these important issues. Um, questions. Um, I wanted to start with, there's a question about, um, for Aaron, how will a Detroit City Charter Amendment fit with the GLEWA's rate setting authority? Will the GLEWA be bound by it? Uh oh, Aaron, did we lose you? I'm sorry, yeah, my, my audio cut out temporarily. Could you uh, repeat that, that question for me? Oh, yes. Um, how will a Detroit City Charter Amendment fit with GLEWA's rate setting authority? Will GLEWA be bound by it? Yeah, so there, yeah, there's an interesting relationship between GLEWA and DWC, as we all know. Um, and GLEWA does have uh, the ultimate authority to sign off on rate setting, but they have um, really delegated, delegated the task of rate making to, um, to DWSD. Um, and so as long as a DWSD is meeting the revenue requirements set by uh, GLEWA, um, it can set rates um, as it deems fit, essentially. Um, and uh, we know that an income-based water rate, um, you know, I'm not an expert in the economic impacts of, of um, an income-based water rate, but there have been many great experts that have, that have written extensively about that. But um, there's evidence that it could uh, actually help uh, DWSD um, uh, take in more funding through, through collections rather than less. Um, so, while this would this uh, Detroit uh, Charter Amendment would not um, Glee would not would not be bound by the Detroit Charter. Um, ultimately, it it would only affect rates for DWSD, but that um, that fits in with that relationship between Glee and, and DWSD. How can um, residents support the Charter Initiative? Um, we would welcome feedback on these recommendations. Um, you can contact me. I'll drop my email address in the, the chat here. Um, and um, you can also submit your own. Um, whoops, I think I didn't submit to everyone. Um, you can send that to, sorry, I'm not very good at multitasking here. Um, you can submit comments uh, through the Detroit Charter um, Commission website as well. Um, and I believe there's going to be a comment period um, after um, the, the, uh, the period for submitting amendment recommendations. So once, once that deadline has passed and all of the um, amendment recommendations have been submitted, there I think will be a comment period, but I'll, I'll have to double check on that. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, there were earlier some questions about the number of residents that are still without water. Um, can Emily or Nadia speak to that? I can speak to that and maybe maybe Monica might also want to jump in. Um, so we, we don't have data about the current number of residents that don't have water because DWSD has to date refused to release that data to us. Um, we submitted a FOIA request in April of 2020 asking for data on the current number of houses that were shut off and um, those that had been turned back on. Um, they were supposed to, by law, respond to that FOIA request with the data by June 11th. Um, and they have not given the data yet. Um, and so what that does, you know, that, that kind of lack of transparency and that refusal to release the data essentially allows the city to make claims that we can't fact check, that, you know, they don't have any records of people who've been shut off. Um, we also know um, through, uh, through experiences with the Water Rights Hotline and with uh, Great More Connection Food Pantry that there are many examples of families that were still being shut off in the midst of the moratorium. Um, and Monica posted in the chat that just yesterday there was another call um, from a landlord that that was um, that had not paid the bill and, and the, the residents were getting shut off. Um, so I don't know if Monica has other things to add to that. Yeah, just 
very quickly, Emily's exactly correct. Uh, we did receive a call yesterday. I know that uh, Cecily and the team are working on it in terms of getting water delivered and getting water restored. Uh, but what we find problematic is that there is still any process in place of turning off water in the middle of a pandemic. We find it all egregious, but especially during a pandemic. And so uh, what we are continuing to do is to try to evidence at every turn, uh, not only through the visualization and data and the rigor of, of science and research, but then also helping people build the courage to tell their own stories. Because as Nadia talked about, many of these families are hiding in fear uh, we work with families that uh, have language challenges, and so we have had to partner. Uh, we, the people of Detroit, partnered with the University of Michigan and also Freshwater Future and the National Wildlife Federation, uh, Healing Our Waters, to be able to produce uh, at least the resources. And thank God for Tiana's amazing technical and graphic abilities to put together a resource piece that you can find on We, the People of Detroit, because what we were finding is many families with language barriers and with English not being their first language, they still were not able to get the information uh, to get uh, access to the so resources and services that supposedly had been made available. We also found that the other challenges in Detroit, about 50% of the population uh, does not have access to the internet on a consistent and quality basis. And so when you're asking people to go to a website or you're asking people to uh, access the resources they need through some digital mechanism, you still are actually participating in some form of uh, segregation because you're not including the fact that you know that these disparities exist. And so uh, we're continuing to lift up that we feel as though there is still not enough being done in our local municipality to ensure the human right to water. We are hearing these conversations nationally. We're hearing it regionally. And even at the state level, we know that the governor has done some things through the executive order process to restore water. Where we are still deeply challenged and concerned is there seems to be no leadership in place within the city of Detroit that is committed to ensuring that Detroiters have access to clean, safe, and affordable water. And so that's the commitment that you see coming out of the water warriors, out of much of the research that is happening, is that there has to be a concerted effort in the city of Detroit to make sure not only from a public health standpoint, from a legal standpoint and a legislative standpoint, that Detroiters have access to the human right to water. Okay. Um, another question is, can we get the attorney general involved in nudging DWSD and providing the, the information that we need? I don't know if that could be a question that maybe Erin or Monica could address. That sounds like maybe an Erin question. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, there is definitely an effort at the state level uh, to um, address water affordability. I think, um, I think that uh, pushing on the Whitbird administration and on AG Nessel would certainly be helpful. Um, uh, and I'm definitely open to suggestions for, um, for how to go about doing that. Um, I think uh, the more support that we can get from AG Nessel, the better. Um, and then the last question I see here is, can someone explain the lease agreement between the Great Lakes Water Authority and um, DWSD? Erin, do you want to take a stab at that one? I'm sorry, I missed that one again. My, my audio keeps cutting in and out here. Could you repeat that? Please. Um, can, can someone explain the lease agreement between the Great Lakes Water Authority and um, the Detroit Water Department? Yes, definitely. I can explain that. Um, so there are, there are really two relevant agreements between the city and GLIWA that govern uh, DWSD rate making in particular. So there's the, the regional water supply system lease and the water and sewer agreement. Um, uh, and so these agreements really govern rate making by and between Gliwa and the city and by and between the city and its residents. Um, so um, 
I'm sorry, was the question specifically about um, how lease that lease agreement impacts rate making? Um, it didn't specify, but that is what my assumption would be. Sure. Yeah. So in terms of the rate making um, uh, between the city and the residents, um, the, the regional water supply system lease states that GLIWA uh, has the right to establish rates for water service to customers of the water system, including retail water customers. But pursuant to the water and sewer agreement, GLIWA has delegated that right to establish rates um, for DWSD's water service customer, uh, water service um, customers of DWSD. Um, and the water and sewer agreement also specifies that any water service rates established by DWSD uh, must be reasonably projected to meet the revenue requirement established by GLIWA for retail customers, as well as the costs of the water system and reasonable in its relation to the costs incurred um, by GLIWA for the supply of water. Um, so basically DWSD has the authority to set rates for water service for its residents. Um, and while the, the water and sewer agreement establishes some rate making requirements, those requirements only pertain to how much the city must collect through rates, but not the specific rate structure um, that it has to use to meet that revenue requirement. Um, so I hope that that answers that question. Okay. One can, I just, can I just add that the uh, current this GLIWA uh, business, this regional authority, uh, was created under the illegal and unconstitutional emergency manager uh, rule tenure in the city of Detroit, and it is was in violation of the city charter, which says that any change to a city utility and water is a utility. In fact, a lot, water is the biggest asset in the city's budget which is the reason why the city should never have been uh, subject to any uh, bankruptcy because you can't have a $60 billion asset and be bankrupt. The bankruptcy was never approved by the mayor or the city council. But that GLIWA authority is in violation of the charter which says that any change, sell, lease, or change in the ownership of a city utility must be approved by the citizens by vote. It was never brought to the citizens by vote. And it was so everything that has happened with relation to Detroit's water, which has been a, a target for uh, uh, many people uh, around the city for decades and decades to gain control of, uh, has been unconstitutional, it's been illegal, and it has been unfair and lacking in equity. So I don't want people to assume that it just happened as a matter of course. It did not. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Tiana. Before we go to the next, I just put a link because I think it's critical what we just heard from the Honorable Councilwoman in terms of institutional knowledge of what has transpired. And then I also put a link in the chat to make sure that for those that are, are researchers and readers, there is also research that supports uh, the historical content of what transpired around seizing control over the water department. And some of that work was rooted in mapping the water crisis and the work that Emily and Nadia and others at the Community Research Collective have done. Okay, I'm running up against our time, but I do want to um, address this question. How, um, can residents support the litigation being put forth by Alice Jennings? Um, is that, oh, go ahead. Well, yes. And um, what we will more than likely be doing once we get the first kind of round the legal step over is having some type of workshop similar to this, to explain the legal issues involved and how people can support uh, what's going on. And as um, has been said uh, by Mama Lila and many uh, of us, that uh, this lit there's litigation, there's legislation, and there's mobilization and agitation. And we will have to do all of the above to Get, bring this to justice. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Monica, do you want to close us out? I do. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Tiana, for just doing an amazing job of pulling this all together for us. Uh, just exceptional work once again. To Professor Emily Kudo, to the amazing Dr. 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 Nadia Gaber, thank you for your excellent work and all of your leadership with We the People of Detroit's Community Research Collective. We want to thank attorney Aaron Matty uh, and the Great Lakes Environmental Law Center. I want to thank Freshwater Futures. We want to thank all of our partners and funders. We want to thank the Honorable Dr. Reverend Joanne Watson and attorney Alice Jennings for coming on the line and joining us. And as always, I'm so grateful for We the People of Detroit and all of our volunteers and my amazing board. We love you. We love you. And we'll see you next time. But in the meantime, please make sure you're sharing this information. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I see a lot of thanks in the chat. Thank you, Monica. Ooh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It was amazing. So I have a few people on. People can go to our website, wethepeopledetroit.com, and I think some of this work is up there as well.